So just in general, some pros, uh, some advantages to the exemption number. Again, for those products that qualify for an exemption number, it does make you legal for sale. You, there's no question about your status. You are legal for sale. Currently with a submission number, you're not legal for sale. But with an exemption number, you're deemed to have a product license. You're deemed to be legal for sale in Canada. So this addresses a lot of concerns that the pharmacies, for example, had when they were looking for products with licenses and for consumers looking for licensed products, ones that have been approved by Health Canada. So an exemption number makes you uh, legal for sale. So it increases consumer and retailer confidence. It also gives you some predictability for market access. You know that once you get your submission number, if your product hasn't been issued a license, then you have 180 days and you'll get an exemption number and you'll still be legal for sale. So it's another route to market. Again, there's some expectation of the ability to advertise Currently, technically, you're not allowed to advertise unless you have a natural product number. Because an EN is deemed to be equivalent to a product license, we're hoping there will be some flexibility in the ability to advertise. So we've been told that guidance will be issued shortly regarding um, what you can and cannot say in advertisements for products with exemption, exemption numbers. Again, as mentioned, you can make notifications, so any changes that don't affect safety, quality, and efficacy can made, be made for products with exemption numbers. The other benefit to the system as it stands is that we've been told that in order to qualify for an exemption number, there are some modifications you can make to your product. So, for example, you can delete target populations, you can delete Schedule A claims, or you can remove unsafe ingredients. So it, just to, to reiterate this, if your product meets one of the risk criteria that we discussed before, then you cannot apply for an exemption number. However, if you want to uh, eliminate those risk criteria, the NHPD is allowing you to make certain changes. So you do have the option to remove a subpopulation. So for example, if you have a product uh, that it says right now it's for all ages, you could clarify that to say product is for, ch uh, for children 12 years of age and up and for adults. So you can, you can remove uh, the risk criteria, which is for children under 12 years of age. So if it's in order to qualify for an exemption number, you can remove a subpopulation. Again, whether it's children under 12 years of age or pregnant and nursing women, you can remove Schedule A claims, again, in order to qualify for an exemption number, and you can remove an unsafe ingredient. So I'm, for the latter one, I'm, I'm still requesting clarification on that because to me that would seem to be a minimum an amendment and possibly a fundamental change, but it, it does say that you can uh, remove unsafe ingredients to qualify for an exemption number. So if you plan to do this, then you need to notify your submission coordinator of the changes, that you are making the changes in order to qualify for an exemption number, and you need to file the revised product license application as well as the label text. Then in terms of the fax back form, you need to send that to the dedicated line. So there's two notifications, one to the submission coordinator about the changes either to your claims or your formulation or your directions for use. And the other is sending the completed fax back form for the exemption number to the dedicated line. So there is some flexibility built into the system. Again, you don't have to submit a new product license application if you want to make any of these changes. It's just the revised PLA and label text that needs to be submitted. Again, some of the cons, and they're not necessarily all cons, uh, if the product has specific dosing directions, again, uh, for children under 12 years of age and pregnant and nursing women, you cannot apply for an exemption number. However, as just mentioned, you can remove those target populations to make your product, product eligible for an exemption number. Uh, some of the other risk criteria I don't think we can really argue with in terms of Schedule A claims or uh, prohibited or unsafe ingredients. International trade certificates will not be issued for products with exemption numbers. Again, you need to have a, a product number, a product license number to get an international trade certificate. As mentioned, you cannot make amendments or fundamental changes for products with exemption numbers. Basically, the product going to market has had a review of safety, so the NHPD has determined that it's safe, but there's only been a preliminary review of quality and efficacy data. So again, there's additional costs, both from industry's uh, perspective as well as the government in filling out forms, identifying products that are eligible, 
but potentially the benefits in the end will outweigh that. Uh, and as mentioned, products that don't opt in for an EN, they will have a prioritized review of the applications on a risk-based approach. So as mentioned, the, the exemption number is really a fallback position for the government. If they cannot get your application reviewed and licensed within a, a predictable amount of time, then your next route to market would be to get an exemption number. And we'll look at some of those performance targets in a few, a few minutes. Um, the other thing in terms of potentially a, a con for this, the exemption number is the need to post information on the website, and that may not be a good thing from a business perspective. There may be um, some competitive edge given up if you have to put information on the database. Uh, the other question that we're still looking into is whether an access to information request can be made for a product with an exemption number. Right now, you cannot make an ATI request until a product is licensed. So as I say, we're trying to get clarification whether you can make an ATI request for a product once it gets an exemption number. So as I said, there's a couple of other policies that come into play and that are linked uh, with the FLAR, with the new regulations, and that need to be discussed at the same time. So one of them is the NHPD's application management policy. We'll just look at these briefly because we are going a little bit over time. Again, this came out on August the 9th. It came out via the BEEP email system. Hopefully everybody has a copy of it because it is not yet posted on the Natural Health Products Directorate website. So this application management policy was discussed by the NHPD in workshops that were held earlier in the year. It applies to all applications received from August the 10th onwards. So more stringent requirements are going into place in terms of what defines a complete application. So applications will be categorized as to the evidence that they are supported by, whether it is pre-cleared information. So applications attesting to pre-cleared information, specifically abbreviated labeling standards, amendments referencing pre-cleared information, compendial or monograph applications and labeling standards will be in one pile, and all the other applications that do not attest in their entirety to pre-cleared information will go in another pile. So these would be amendments for a significant change requiring assessment of safety, efficacy, and or quality, homeopathic products, non-traditional applications, TPD category four monographs and labeling standards and traditional applications. So we're looking at two streams, one applications that attest in their entirety to evidence found in pre-cleared information and then all the other applications. The key changes are going to be that all ingredients, whether they're non-medicinal or medicinal, must be in the natural health products ingredient database before the application is submitted. Now, this has been the case for compendial applications for a little while now, but it's now applying to all applications. <coughs> so your application will not be accepted for review by the NHPD if all your ingredients, non-medicinal and medicinal, are not in the ingredient database. Right now, we're looking at approximately four weeks to have ingredients reviewed and assessed and entered into the database. So this is another timeline that you need to take into consideration. As well, just because an ingredient is listed in the database, it does not necessarily mean that it is safe and or effective. That will still have to be demonstrated within your product license application. Again, applications that are not based on pre-cleared information must be complete before a submission number is issued. You won't be getting an early or an evidence IRN. It's either complete and accepted or incomplete and refused. And again, a complete application is required to get a submission number, which is required to get an exemption number down the road. So the Natural Health Products Director within this application management policy has also come out with some proposed performance targets. And again, these are proposed targets. They are not based in law with the exception of compendial applications. So if we're looking at the proposed performance target for applications attesting to pre-cleared information, they're proposing a total of 60 days from the date your application is received to the date a product license is either issued or refused. The breakdown within that is approximately 10 days to assess the application for completeness to make sure there are no critical deficiencies, and then, <coughs> excuse me, approximately 50 days to conduct the assessment 
and then either issue the license or refuse the license. So again, this refers to monographs, abbreviated labeling standards, labeling standards, and amendments re um, referencing pre-cleared information. Again, uh, just with the pre-cleared uh, applications, there's no submission numbers that are issued and no EIRN. So you're not looking at exemption numbers for uh, applications attesting to pre-cleared information. If we look at the applications that are not attesting in entirety to pre-cleared information, then we're looking at a proposed performance target of 180 days. And again, this is a proposed performance target. It's not based in law. It's what the NHBD is hoping to accomplish in the review of applications. So that 180 days is first broken down into the receipt of an application acceptance letter or refusal notice, and that will be within 30 days. So they're dedicating approximately 10 days to make sure that the application is complete in terms of the, the product license application itself, animal tissue forms, safety, quality, efficacy data, label text, et cetera, and then an initial assessment of the quality of the data being submitted. So within 30 days, you'll know whether you're, uh, you'll either get an acceptance letter or you'll get a refusal notice of saying that there's critical deficiencies and it's back to the drawing board. And as, as we mentioned before, with the application acceptance letter, it will give you the information about applying for an exemption number, how, when, and where. So after the first 30 days, then again, this is when the days start ticking uh, for the exemption number. We're looking at full assessment within 90 days. If an IRN is issued, the clock stops. Uh, the applicant has approximately 30 days, or has 30 days to respond to the IRN. <clears throat> when the information comes back to the Natural Health Products Directorate, the clock starts ticking again. They've allotted themselves 45 days to assess the response and then another 15 days to issue a regulatory decision, i.e. the product is either licensed or refused. So that's a total of 180 days from, again, the date of receipt to the date of issuing or refusing a license. And these are all in calendar, calendar days. And as mentioned, if we're talking about the exemption number, the clock for its 180 days doesn't start until you get your submission number. Just some comments. As I say, these are proposed performance targets. So the NHPD is qualifying that they will only be able to meet these performance targets or attempt to meet them if you're using the electronic product license application form. And they're promoting that this will soon be the only acceptable format to them. So it's advised to start using it as soon as possible and get used to using it. As well, the EPLA should be submitted either by a secure email for which you need to be uh, set up as a registered trading partner or on CD, DVD. So they still will accept other applications. They'll still accept your application on the original paper form or they'll accept printouts of the EPLA. However, they've specifically stated that you can expect delays in processing time if you do submit paper applications. So again, strongly encouraged to get used to using the EPLA and submitting it electronically. Either register yourself or your consultant as a trading partner or submit it on a CD or DVD. <coughs> again, if you have any questions about the application management policy, you're encouraged to contact either your submission coordinator or the new email address pla.info.dlmm at hc-sc-gc-ca for more information. We'll just go over this quickly. As I mentioned, all medicinal and non-medicinal ingredients must be included in the Natural Health Products Ingredient Database before your application will be accepted for review. So there is some specific guidance documents, again, that came out via the BEEP email system the other day. Uh, with documents telling you how to classify medicinal ingredients and classify non-medicinal ingredients, what type of information was required to support the addition of a medicinal ingredient to the database, as well as what was required to uh, get a non-medicinal ingredient incorporated into the database. Again, we're looking at an additional four-week turnaround for the review and integration of new medicinal ingredients and non-medicinal ingredients into the database. And you're going to have to take that four-week turnaround time into consideration when you're looking at projected times to market. 